All right, tonight we are, we're actually going to be wrapping up the, our focus on the missionary methods of Paul. In fact, next week where it would have been our final uh, lesson, Joey Treat, one of our missionaries, is going to be here. And so that the, we're, the quarter is going to change after that. So this will be the last one tonight. In fact, it really relates well because we were ending right at the point that I, liked, that I wanted to cover for the missionary methods of Paul. And I, I believe it is a mission statement from Paul in 1 Corinthians 9, 19 through 23. And by the way, I work very hard on putting a PowerPoint together, and that thing is just really good. But you know what's wonderful about that is if you forget to send it to the control room, you really can't use it. And I realized that as, uh, as I was doing the lesson. I went, well, I didn't send it. So we have the notes, and so really the only thing about the PowerPoint was to just show what passages were coming up. And so Jeffrey is handing those out, so if you're ready to go on that, just if you can raise your hand, then, then Christian can get it to you as soon as possible, and we really don't need the PowerPoint. But what we've looked at is how Paul, really, he is, a, he, he is an instrument chosen by God, and therefore, through him, through him being an apostle, he is the equipment that we need. If we follow his, his strategies, his method, then we can, in turn, be missionaries as well through his method. And so that's the idea. And last week we talked about the difference between accommodation and rights. And I'd like for us to, to look at 1 Corinthians 8, 8 through 9. And, and I can read that very quick, but the idea is a certain... You know, Let's see, I'm going to read it. He said, Food will not co commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. In chapter 9 and verse 12, it says, If others share this rightful claim on you, do not we even more. Nevertheless, we have not made use of this right. All right, so he, he talks about the rights that he has, and he's saying we've not made use of those rights. What, in verse 18 of 1 Corinthians 9, he says, What then is my reward? That in my preaching I may present the gospel free of charge, so as not to make full use of my rights in the gospel. We ended last week on the fact that Paul was establishing his rights as a Christian. He was establishing his rights as an apostle as he's speaking to the Corinthians. And it almost seems like he's starting an argument, or it, it seems like he's saying, I have this right, I have this right, I, I have a right to have a, a, a believing wife, I have a right to be paid for the gospel's sake. But when he says, I've not made use of that right, he's establishing something, an example for them to follow. And it's not about your rights. It's not about my rights. And in fact, 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 1 and 19 uh, explain this. Who has 1 Corinthians 9, 1 and 19? All right, thank you, Brandon. Um, verse 1, am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have, let me read this. Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord if... And then 19. Yeah. For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win the more. All right, so when he gives his rights, he's giving a defense of himself. But when he says, I've not made use of that right, he's showing that he has made himself a servant. So he had the right to do, do that, didn't he? he? He had the right to make himself a servant. To make oneself that way is a choice. It's his right. So Paul already did this as, as a Christian. So notice in verse 1, he says, he says, Am I not free? What did he do with his freedom? He said, For though I am free from all, verse 19, I have made myself a servant to all. So with his freedom, with his rights, he... He made himself a servant to do what? Do, do you notice what he says there? We're gonna, we'll notice this seven times within this passage, verses 19 through 23. So that he might win the more of them. You might have to gain the more, 
uh, this, so really, we're going we're gonna to unpack that and, and see what is he talking about in the idea of winning more of them. But I wanted to, to really look at this, this idea that to, when he says to make himself a servant, he's trying to serve all people. That's, that's a hard task to do, to serve other people. But before we look at this, what, we know that Paul is already a servant. Romans 1, 1 through 2. Who, who has that? Carrie's got it. All right, Christian's on his way. Romans 1, 1 through 2. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Thank you. So he says, is Paul is already a servant of Christ. So when he's talking about being a servant of, notice, um, for though I'm free from all, I've made myself a servant to all. He's literally trying to serve all people. It's under the understanding that he's already a servant of Christ. So he cannot serve all people and, and that betray his service to Christ. So we're going to really look at what this is not and really what this is. So why was Paul trying to gain all people? Why was he trying to win all people? I have an example of this. When, we were, when, when I was a kid, I remember going to a restaurant, and uh, I was one of those kids that always had a little knapsack with me. I had like a little backpack that I carried with me. And it came in handy on this day because at this restaurant, they had a free candy jar that did not say take one only. And so I opened up my knapsack and I dumped every one of those candies into the knapsack and zipped it up and walked out, not thinking. Well, the next day at school, I was the most popular kid at school. I remember unzipping that knapsack, and I'd give a candy. Man, I had more friends than I'd ever had in my life until the last candy was gone. Where were they? Where'd they go? No more friends. I gained a lot of friends through accommodating their sweet tooth, <laughs> to, through trying to, to win them. Maybe that's what I was doing. I, I'm not sure, because I was about seven years old. Uh, this was in primary school when I took this with me. Yeah, that's about the time where you're going to carry a knapsack like that. You know, actually, it was a fanny pack. Let's just, uh, that's what it was. It was. I said knapsack because I, I felt better about it. But at the time, no, it was, it was a fanny pack. Let's just be real. So did I do this? Did I give this candy to please them? And I think we need to, be, we need to realize, is Paul trying to win people to his own favor to please them? Is he being a people pleaser? That's a, that's a challenging one. Is he being a people pleaser? Galatians 1, 9 and 10. Who, who, has, who has that? Oh, David's got it. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. For do I now please men? For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I still pleased men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. Mm. So verse 10, he's, he's asking a very good question. Am I now seeking to please men? Am I trying to please them? And then he goes to say, if I was trying to please them, I would not be a servant of Christ. So we've already seen that he's willing to make himself a servant to all using the freedom but in Romans 1, in verse 1, he is a servant of Christ. So if he's seeking to please others, he can't be a servant of Christ. So which one is it, Paul? Are you going to serve Christ or are you going to serve others? Or is there a way to serve both? Can you serve others while serving Christ? So it would show that he's not being a people pleaser. He's not trying to win their favor, as it were, for his own benefit. Uh, that would make him uh, a politician. And in fact, I, I did my thesis, and I tried to call it Paul the politician and include the pun in the, in the, in the word, but it did not work. 
They did not get that into the thesis. But is Paul being a politician? Is he willing to, to uh, say what needs to be said to please his audience? No, he's not. So the winning process is not to win man's approval or to gain something from man, but for something much deeper. All right, who has 19 through 21? Uh, 1 Corinthians 9, 19 through 21. Merrill's got it. Though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. Thank you. So notice you've got three different groups of people. So he mentions all people. I've made myself a servant to all that I might win the more. But then he breaks down what that all represents. And it really does. Because he says, to the Jew, I became as a Jew. Then those under the law, I became as one under the law. Well, is that not the same thing? Well, it very well could be Jews that are Jewish in every way except birth. We talked about proselytes. Those who had been converts to Judaism who were Gentile by birth. He was willing to accommodate them and reach them. Most likely that's what he's referring to. But then it says those outside the law. He's referring to Gentiles. And that is everyone. That is all people. And so I love that he explains in verse 19 that he is willing to accommodate, reach all people, and then he explains how he did it. And by doing that, we can actually look and we can check on Paul and see, did he really do this? In the first place, Jews. How did he accommodate Jews? Um, Philippians 3, 4 through 8. All right, Ken's got it. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. I was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, and as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassed worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered a loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I might gain Christ. Mm. You know, the word for gain Christ is kerdino. It's the same word as to win or to gain the more. So for him to gain Christ, he was willing to look at the accolades of his life, to literally look at this list that made him a Hebrew of Hebrews, that made him just who he has always been. And he says, for the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, man, I consider these things as dung, refuse, garbage, rubbish. Man, that is a, that's strong wording. But what's powerful is, to the Jew, I became as a Jew. I think that's important because we say, well, this, Paul is a Jew. But what we read here is he was willing to forget that part of his life. He was willing, sorry, he was willing to put that in his past but not forget it. To accommodate and reach back to the Jews so why they would consider that Christ was the end of the law for salvation as well. And so by reaching them, by accommodating where they were, he was willing to do this and, uh, and, and it, it would help to reach, uh, reach Jews. And we'll look at that in, in a moment as to how he did that in Acts chapter 16. Uh, but we're going to look at this real quick. We'll just look at those under the law. Uh, those under the law, it could be Jews, but it also can be proselytes. Can we look at Acts 13, 13 through 17 and 38 through 43? That's in one, in one sitting. So Ansel, if you'd like. So Christian, just stay there with him. Companions, set 
sailed from Paphos and came to Perga and Pamphylia, and John left them and returned to Jerusalem. But they went on from Perga and came to Antioch and Pisidia, and on the Sabbath day they went to the synagogue and sat down. After the reading from the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them, saying, Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. So Paul stood up and motioned with his hand and said, Men of Israel, and you who fear God, listen. The God of the people Israel chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt, and with uplifted hand led them out of it. And 38 through 43. Yes, sir. Let it be known to you, brethren, therefore, brethren, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and by him everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, lest what is said in the prophets should come about. Look, you scoffers, be astonished and perish, for I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe, even if one tells it to you. And they went out, the people begged that these things might be told them the next Sabbath. After the meeting of the synagogue broke up, many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who, as they spoke to them, urged them to continue in the grace of God. So there's a lot to discuss here. And notice they are in the middle of their travels here, where Paul and Barnabas, they are at Antioch in Pisidia. And so they've you know, they went on from Perga and came to this place. And notice, they came on the Sabbath day. They went into the synagogue and they sat down. We know, though, that this was, they've never met these men before. And they sit down and they're in a synagogue. And for a synagogue to take place, there has to be 10 or more Jewish men in order for them to be able to have their discussion. And so it's more like a Jewish Bible class. And so in the same way, when you get a visitor to come in here, generally you're not going to say, hey, you're visiting, would you teach the class? Here's a microphone. Generally that's not going to take place, but why did that happen here? Most likely, remember he was a Pharisee, most likely he had Pharisee, his Pharisee robes as he traveled because they went to the synagogue. Most likely they saw this man as a teacher of the law. They gave him the floor. They gave him the opportunity. And so, again, this is part of his accommodation to reach his brethren and not forget where he came from. And notice what he did. He took them from, and he mentions brothers the entire time, he took them from being in Egyptian captivity to then wandering in the wilderness for 40 years all the way to Jesus being crucified. If Paul was a people pleaser, if he was trying to just gain the crowd, he definitely would, would not have said uh, verses, I think it was 41, he, beware, or 40 and 41, beware therefore lest what is said in the prophets should come about. Look you scoffers, be astounded and perish for I'm doing a work in your day, a work that, a, days, a work that you will not believe even if one tells it to you. He's telling them, He's looking at some in that group that do not want to hear what he has to say. And he's willing to tell them like it is. But there were some who begged him, please come back the next Sabbath. Shows that they are craving the word that he's bringing. Notice who, who, he's, who was craving it. It says, after the meeting of the synagogue broke up, many Jews and devout converts to Judaism. To the Jew, I became as a Jew. To those under the law, I became as one under the law. These individuals wanted to hear more about this, this way that he was discussing. That he pointed them, using the scriptures, pointed them to Christ. Again, it shows how Paul was willing to reach the Jews and those under the law. Uh, all right, Galatians 2, or Acts 17, 1 through 3. Who has that? Acts 17, or 16, sorry, Acts 16, 1 through 3. Sorry, Charlotte, your mama. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Paul also came to Derby and to Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. 
He was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. So Paul had Timothy circumcised. Why? For ministry? So, exa- so they could accept him and they would listen to him as he spoke. Exactly. I'm just relaying that for the microphone. Um, but I- exactly right. Because the Jews, notice it says, because the Jews that were there knew that his father was a Greek. And so he had him circumcised. He made him into a proselyte. Made him into a proselyte. Uh, notice though, Let's go to Galatians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. So remember, he had Timothy circumcised. But let's look at Titus. Good thing we didn't get Timothy here. Okay, we got Titus here. <laughs> Timothy, you're, you're reading for Titus here. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. I went up by revelation, and I laid before them but privately before those who were of repute, the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, lest somehow I should be running or had run in vain. But even Titus, who was with me, was not compelled to be circumcised, though he was a Greek, but because of false brethren secretly brought in, who slipped in to spy out our freedom, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. To them we did not yield submission even for a moment, that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. So why, and, and, and huge papers have been written on these two passages. So I'm asking this question, I realize this could be, you know, we could really spend a long time on this. Or, or not. What, why did he circumcise Timothy, but he would not give in for a moment and have Titus circumcised. Is this an inconsistency on Paul's part? And first of all, the fact that he was not willing to give in even for a moment, he was not willing to yield in submission for a moment to have Titus circumcised, it, in a second, it shows that he uh, was not going to accommodate all. All right, Jeffrey. Sure, yeah. He's almost there. All right, thanks. Um, I think in one instance, it's kind of like Acts 15, where the Jews were trying to require the Gentiles to follow the law of Moses. They were saying, without getting circumcised, you are not saved. You know. So the Jewish Christians, right. Right, yeah. And these false brethren, as they're called in verse 4, they were teaching the Galatians and other Christians, no doubt, that you had to get circumcised in order to be. And Paul had to take a stand there to show no circumcision is not a salvation issue for Christians. You yes. cannot label it as such. Versus in the other scenario, it was, to, it was to accommodate in a way that was accommodating without endorsing a doctrine of circumcision equals salvation. Right. So. Ex- great point. So Paul was not inconsistent. His audience was. See, it was for the Jews in Acts 16 is why he had Timothy circumcised. But why he did not have Titus circumcised is because of false brothers who were brought in, whether they were, they were claiming to be Christians, but they were not, uh, whether they were Christians who were the Judaizers that were forcing circumcision for salvation. He did not accommodate that. And so it's people who would want to say that he was talking to Jews both in Acts 16 and in Galatians 2, they say Paul was the one that's inconsistent. So Paul was not willing to accommodate someone who's added to the Word of God. To, to, to force circumcision for salvation, he would not give in. And so that's actually important. You don't see in the list, to the strong I became strong. In fact, the list is given for the strong, if you look at the context. He's telling the strong in 1 Corinthians 8 that he said, you know, food does not um, uh, do anything for us, you know, for God. But food can cause my brother to stumble. And if food would cause my brother to stumble, I would never eat meat. And he's trying to explain that this knowledge puffs you up, but love builds up. 
And he's trying to tell the strong who have that knowledge that you need to put your brother first and not your stomach. And so he's willing to accommodate the weak, but he is not going to accommodate someone who in strength would railroad their brother. I think that's very important. All right, so uh, thank you for, for that answer, Jeffrey. It's fantastic. And so uh, I think it's also important while we're here that Peter provides a poor example of accommodation in verses 11 through 14 of Galatians chapter 2. And, uh, and, and in fact, what's happened is when these Judaizing Christians came from Jerusalem with James, they see that Peter is eating with the Gentiles. And the moment they come in, Peter gets up from the table and he goes and eats with the Jews. And so who has uh, verses 11 through 14 of Galatians 2? Yeah, Steve's got it. Now when, now when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, If you, being a Jew, live in the manner of Gentiles and not as the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? So does this, do you get a picture of, of Paul who was just willing to accommodate everyone just, just to make everybody feel comfortable? I'd say this was the most uncomfortable situation ever because Paul was actually going to oppose Peter, the one who stood up on the day of Pentecost and preached the Pentecost sermon. Well, it just goes to show that they didn't have the Holy, they weren't carried about by the Holy Spirit in every situation. Because he made the decision when the circumcision party that came from Jerusalem that they were binding, most likely the uh, Acts 15 situation, they were binding this on Christians and they're coming in and he's sitting there, he's eating with the Gentiles. Ooh, yeah, they're not circumcised. I better go eat with, with these individuals. He played a hypocrite. And in fact, what did it cause? When Peter did this, what did it cause for the congregation? The other Jews followed it. Even Barnabas followed in, in this, right? Uh, and I, I, we didn't actually, yeah, we did read that. Uh, so even Barnabas did. And so it, it caused a problem, and Paul had to, he had to handle this. He had to reprimand him, and he did so. He withstood him to his face for doing this. I think that's, I think that's a very good point. Then I've actually I read a, a guy who claimed that Peter was actually just following Paul's accommodation process. Peter was the one that was to the Gentiles, it became the Gentile, to the Jew, I became the Jew, and it was Paul who was going against his own method. Uh, but this man was Catholic and he had to try to uphold Peter because Peter was the Pope. And if Peter was wrong, then he couldn't handle that. And so again, I was thankful for his writings because I had something to say you know, as, in, in response to it. But it was wrong. It, it goes to show that Paul would not accommodate someone who knew better as far as had influence. Uh, we can't stand for adding to the word in order for a Gentile to, to, to be, they're told they have to be circumcised in order to be saved. It's not right, and Paul, and Paul would not accommodate it. Okay, um, any, any thoughts? Yeah, Yvonne's got something. And if Paul had decided to please people and his goal would be to have people won over rather than to spread the gospel and gone on... Um, then he would never have been able to, to confront Peter. Exactly. Because they would have said, well, you did the same thing. So I think it just helps me see it is so critical that when we have a choice to do right, mm -hmm. even if we don't even know what will happen in the future, it will kill our testimony and, and our opportunity to save our sisters and brothers because they're going to look at us and go, well, you did the same thing. It's, it's really important to look forward 
Yeah. Rather than just at this one situation, we have to understand that our actions can really hurt our brothers and sisters later. Great, great point. You know, and I, I think you're, you're spot on with that because if Paul was willing to bend the gospel, uh, then it wouldn't, have, it wouldn't have mattered. And he wouldn't have, he wouldn't have reprimanded Peter for, for doing this. And, but I think also it's important that if the early Christians added to the word, how easy it is it for us to do the same? And we cannot add to the word of God and make things about salvation that God never did. Uh, yes. Meryl. All for them to associate with Gentiles. Yeah. They didn't understand that Gentiles would be saved by Christ. So this was more of a process. It wasn't an easy right. switch to flip. Right. You know, hey, you can eat hogs now. You know, yeah. I mean, even though that was true, they probably still didn't do it. Tradition. Uh but actually, I think the Jerusalem Council, that's what the whole thing was about. It was except it was whether about. Gentiles could be accepted. So they had a meeting about that. So and if it, you'll wasn't, recall, yeah. it wasn't just that Peter was a hypocrite. This was against the law that he had practiced all his entire life. Right. And Paul was right and Peter was wrong, but it was just a little more complex in context. That's a great point. And I think, keep in mind, and some would say, you know, it's possible that the Acts 15 and Galatians 2 correlate, that the Jerusalem Council and the Galatians 2 situation are very close to, to each other. And if you'll remember in the Jerusalem Council, it was Peter who stood up and told about Cornelius, how he saw the Holy Spirit fall on the Gentiles in the same way that he fell on them. And so it was Peter who actually led the discussion. And in Galatians 2, it's Peter who led them away from the Gentiles. And so Peter was willing to give in to a peer pressure. And if Peter could give in to a peer pressure from those who were adding to the word, how easy is it for us? And so, but, but very good point. This old habits die hard. I guess maybe that's the, the, the point. This is a challenge situation. Thank you for giving us that context. So um, I, I think, it's, I think it's, it's important to see that there is a way in which that accommodation needs to take place. The ends do not justify the means. And so we're going to look at those outside the law. How did Paul accommodate those outside the law in the last few moments that we have? Acts 17, 16 through 18. All right, Steve's got that. Did you have 22 through 23 as well? Okay. Now, while Paul waited for them in Athens, his spirit was provoked with him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Therefore, he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers, and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. Then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him, and some said, What does this babbler want to say? Others, others said, He seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them the Jesus, them Jesus and the resurrection. All right, so this goes to show that as he's in Athens, he's preaching about Jesus and the resurrection. He's not preaching a different gospel. He's proclaiming the gospel, but to them, it's something that is different. And because of this, they want to hear it. All right, Christian, over there, um, we're going to look at 22 uh, through 23 of Acts 17. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. Mm. So I love that. Notice when we first read, he sees these, these altars and his spirit is burned within him. Either that's an anger or it it's just saddens him. But when he's speaking before the Areopagus, these are the, the men of, of, the, uh, of the city that make all the rules and most likely establish the religions and then establish the, the, the totem poles that they're worshiping, the objects of their worship. They even have put up this statue to an unknown God. He starts where they are, and he begins to tell them about the unknown God. If you keep going, he then quotes Epimenides and Aratus, their own poets, who are talking about Zeus 
and he applies it to the God, uh, God of creation. In him we live and move and have our being. That's not Zeus. It's God, the unknown God that you're serving. As even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Again, he goes where they are, and so he's able to reach the Gentiles. And he doesn't start with Abraham. He doesn't start with with the law. He starts with their poets, and he starts with their own gods to point to Jesus and the resurrection. Paul's a great example of how to reach the audience, but he did so by bending his approach, not bending the word, not bending the gospel. And that's so important because of 1 Corinthians 9, 22, to the weak I became weak that I might win the weak. I've become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. This is the first time that the word save is mentioned. It's sozo. It means for salvation. And it goes to show that the winning or gaining that he was doing was for their salvation. It's for their soul, not for any other reason. Uh, and so that's something very important. And to the weak I became weak that I might win the weak. This is the only time he doesn't say to the Jew I became as a Jew. To the, to the one under the law became as one of the law, to the, those outside the law became as one outside the law. This is where he says, to the weak I became weak. And we spent the time to look at that in 1 Corinthians 8, 8 through 13, where I, and I mentioned that earlier, and I have that as a reading, and I apologize, but I'm just going to kind of do an overview. He was willing to never eat meat if it caused his brother to stumble. He literally became weak. He was willing to put the weak brother before his own stomach. And I think that is the example of how, how to do that. Um, okay, so let's see. I hate that our time is, 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 is going. But um, Paul, he gives his reason for why he accommodates like he does. And that's in verse 23. He says, I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I may share with them in his blessings. He realizes by doing this, by trying to reach Jews and Gentiles so that they become Christians, it's so that he might share with them and its blessings. He realizes that on that road to, Dis to Damascus, when he was told later on, why do you wait to rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord, that God gave him a second chance and he wants to give every single person he comes in contact that same chance. And he shows how to do it. But he's sharing with them and its blessings. What, you know, that's the thing. What we're trying to do is simply share the blessings that God has given us, the salvation of our souls. I love that. It's the most simple concept, but it's, that's simply what we're trying to do is share in the blessings of heaven. If we have heaven. Why would we want to keep that to ourselves? Well, as long as I get myself to heaven, that's all I got to do. But if I've got the opportunity. I mean, I, I remember going, when we were down there, I saw a dolphin. We saw a dolphin. And I was walking up. We had to leave because it was our last day. Isn't that the time when you see the dolphin? It's the last day and you're leaving. We're walking out and I see several people. I said, I just saw a dolphin. Hey, I just saw a dolphin. It's there. Just wanted you to know we had to leave. That's why we're here. There's a dolphin. And I'm telling everybody, you got to see the dolphin. Flipper. And it, it's something, thanks, man, appreciate it. They, they went a little faster as they got to the beach. Trying to share good news is what we're trying to do. And, uh, and so that's, Paul is showing us how. But I think it's also, and this is the last moment, the main context of 1 Corinthians 9, 19 through 23, is 1 Corinthians 8, verse 1, all the way to 11 in verse 1. That's the main context of what he's talking about here. In 11, verse 1, tells us why we should do the same as he does. He says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And so what Paul is doing, we are to imitate, because when we do that, we're going to imitate Christ. All right, uh, I wish we had more time, because I had some other things I wanted to discuss more in a practical way, but uh, I feel like we, we were able to, to get through it. So let, let's go to, to God in prayer, and then we'll be dismissed. Our Father in heaven, we... We love you, and we're so thankful that you accommodated us in the way that you sent your Son to this earth to live and to die, to be buried and to rise again, so that we don't have to have the finality of death, 
that we can experience eternal life with you in heaven. But help us to do our best to try to share the message of the gospel with others, to reach people where they are, not for them to stay where they are, but to help them get to where they need to be, obeying your word. I pray that you'll help us as we strive to reach the lost for your truth. And I pray that your will be done always. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Thank you all.